Well, it's been a great, great short time. <laughs> it's been a great weekend, and I've really enjoyed being here with you. And uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you, Dave. Well, Phil and I spoke on the phone. You know, Phil has such a pastor's heart. And he said, you know, our guys just need to be encouraged. We just need some encouragement. We've been through some tough things, and we need some encouragement. And so I hope that the messages uh, last night and this morning have done that, have been some encouragement for you. And I think this message will be as well. Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break. And smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Ray and Carol Lehman live on the east coast of the United States. One summer they loaded up their family into the van and they drove to the west coast of the United States. And if you've ever taken one of these cross-country road trips, you know it's a very, very, very long drive. It takes almost forever. And it gets even longer when there are kids in the car. Well, to break up the trip, Carol decided to have a family kindness day. Each family member's name was written on a piece of paper and placed into a hat. Then everyone drew out a name. The challenge was to be as kind as possible throughout the day to that person. And it was a great idea. In the car, at the pit stops, all throughout the day, everyone found a kind deed to do for the person to whom they'd been assigned. Carol's idea went so well that the next day, her youngest son, Darrell, asked to do it again. This time, he passed the hat and everyone picked out a name. Once again, the family went out of their way to pour out love on their selection. Well, little Darrell was enjoying an unprecedented amount of attention. Around lunchtime, people noted the peculiarity. He was drawing all kinds of attention and love and kindness. Well, after a hurried investigation, it was revealed that Darrell had written his name down on all of the pieces of paper he had placed in the hat. He was hoarding the family's affections. Yet it's understandable, isn't it? We all crave kindness and love. Every one of us needs encouragement. Often we're reluctant to pass on an encouraging word for fear of giving the other person the big head. We're afraid of inflating the other guy's ego. Well, author Doug Fields proposes a litmus test to tell if a person needs to be encouraged. He concludes... If a person is breathing, they need encouragement. Life can tear us up and rough us, can tear us down and rough us up. It punches us drunk and slaps us silly. The world we occupy can be a discouraging place. Beatdowns occur daily. That's why a little encouraging can go a long way. Well, today I come to you with words of hope. Reminds me of Hall of Fame basketball coach John Wooden. Wooden led UCLA to 10 national titles, and he had a rule on his team. Whenever a player scored a basket, he was required to wink or nod or smile at the teammate who had passed him the ball. Well, once when instructing the team about this rule, one of the new players asked, but coach, what if he's not looking? Wooden replied, I guarantee you he'll look. The coach knew that we're all looking for affirmation. I've heard it said, man does not live by bread alone. He also needs some buttering up. And it's true. All human beings need daily doses of propping up. When I turned 50 years old, my wonderful wife threw me a surprise birthday party. She decorated the house with scores of colorful helium-filled balloons. They added to the festive mood. But afterwards, those same balloons were a source of sadness, for it didn't take long for the balloons to lose their helium. I mean, like the very next day. The next morning, after all the fun, those balloons were nothing but shriveled up pieces of plastic just hanging from a string. And as pretty as a plastic balloon is filled with helium, a balloon that's deflated looks even uglier. I'll never forget sitting alone in our living room 
thinking about those balloons. And I can remember asking God, Lord, are these balloons a metaphor, even a prophecy? Is the rest of my life going to be like a soaring balloon or like a shriveled up piece of plastic just hanging on? Well, I suppose the verdict's still out. I guess up until now, it's been a little bit of both. But I've drawn one conclusion. As a balloon needs helium, I need encouragement. You know, today, doctors hasten the healing process by performing all kinds of complex, invasive surgeries, bypasses, and ectomies, and transplants. But when it comes to healing for the soul, a simple pat on the back is often the best therapy. I've heard it said, a pat on the back, though only a few vertebrae removed from a kick in the pants, is miles ahead in results. We all desperately need encouragement. And our Lord Jesus comes to us with healing, help, and hope. In Matthew chapter 12, we find a messianic prophecy that speaks of Jesus. Isaiah 42 described the Messiah and the nature of his ministry. And oh, I love Isaiah 42. Let me hit a few highlights for you. Isaiah 42 verse 1, God says of his son and servant, I have put my spirit upon him. Verse 4, God declares of Jesus, he will not fail. Verse 6 calls him a light to the Gentiles. Verse 7 predicts that Jesus will open blind eyes and bring out prisoners from the prison house. In verse 9, we're told that Jesus will do new things. In light of all that Isaiah 42 predicts of Messiah, verse 10 is a command to all the nations, sing to the Lord a new song. And his praise from the ends of the earth. But of all the pungent promises in Isaiah's prophecy, there is one that captures and stirs Matthew's imagination more than all the others. It's verse 3 of Isaiah 42. And it's the passage Matthew quotes of Jesus here in his gospel, chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. Let's read it again. A bruised reed... He will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his name Gentiles will trust. Our Lord is all about encouraging, not extinguishing. To the bruised reed, he is a splint, and to the smoking flax, he is a flint. Jesus is a splint. And a flint. On the banks along the Jordan River, reeds grow high up to the sky. These bulrushes rise upwards as much as 18 feet above the water level. The tip of the reed carries a white plume. Its base can be as thick as three inches in diameter. These reeds help with erosion control in the riverbed, but they have other purposes as well. The lower portion is often used as a cane or a walking stick. The thinner middle section was used to craft musical woodwinds like flutes. And the slender upper portion of the reed was used to carve pens and writing tools. Reeds were almost never used as weapons. And why? Because they lacked the necessary strength. You remember when Jesus spoke of the authority of John the Baptist, he asked rhetorically, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? In other words, unlike John, reeds were flimsy. In fact, a fragile reed swaying back and forth in the wind was a symbol of weakness, and a bruised reed was weaker still. Despite its intended use, a reed was useless when the stalk was either bruised or crimped. It didn't even require a complete break. Just the slightest bend in the stalk was enough for it to get uprooted and tossed aside. Since reeds grew in clumps, no one would ever take the time and make the effort to nurture back to health a single crippled reed. It would be a waste. Just throw it away. Go back down to the bulrushes for another. There were plenty of other reeds to choose from. And the same was true of smoking flax. Flax was used to make cloth. Various fabrics were made from its stalks. Flax is a plant that grows two to four feet high. It yields beautiful blue 
blooms. And when harvested, its stalks are dried out. When the stalks become parched, they're easily shredded into individual threads. The most common use for flax in Jesus' day was as wicks for oil lamps. Dry flax fiber is extremely flammable. Place a thread in a bowl of olive oil, hit it with a spark, and it easily ignites. It burns for a long time. The trick, though, was to keep the flax dry. Moisten it with just a little water, and all it would do is smolder and smoke without really catching fire. A waterlogged wick was of no use. And just like a bruised reed, you threw away a smoking flax. You could purchase dry wicks for a penny a pound. The time and the effort it took to reignite a smoldering wick was a total waste. Just go and grab another. And here's what I think. I believe that some of you in this room this morning, living here in the 21st century, can best be described by these 2,000-year-old oriental analogies. Jesus' words and idioms are timeless. You might not have thought in these terms when you came in this morning, but as you think about it now, this is how you feel inside. You're a bruised reed. You're a smoking flax. Like a broken reed, you're damaged. You've been bent against your will. You've been wounded. Your once tall stalk now has a break. Your weakness has become weaker. You feel like the slightest breeze could blow you over. You know you stand no chance in a windstorm. And you've assumed you're no longer fit for the master's purposes. You feel like it's over for you. It would be easier for God just to go back down to the riverbank and start over with another reed. And like smoldering flax, you're exhausted. Your enthusiasm and passion for life and for ministry, and maybe even for your marriage, has been doused by a million drops of disappointment. Hope for the future, your willingness to love, has been extinguished. If I were to look in the furnace of your heart this morning, I would find a coldness. I'd see a few dying embers of a once roaring fire. Why would God waste time rekindling wet wood? We assume he prefers fresh flax. But here's what we don't realize. Jesus doesn't think the way we think. He's not so utilitarian. In fact, when Jesus builds something, he prefers to start with broken reeds. When Jesus starts a fire, he likes to use smoldering flax. Jesus hasn't given up on you. Jesus is willing to invest in the bruised reed and in the smoking flax. He refuses to write them off or abandon either. He cares deeply for them both. Time used and effort spent, nurturing and healing provided, is never a waste in his eyes. Listen carefully. There are no throwaway people in the eyes of Jesus. Once I saw a movie about a long shot racehorse. There's a scene where the old horse trainer, he saves an injured thoroughbred from a bullet in the head. Later, he's asked why. The old man replies, you don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. And let me repeat that for you. You don't throw a whole life away just because he's banged up a little. This is what Jesus is saying in our text. And it's not only true of old horses but also of banged up people. Certainly, God created mankind to be far different than we turned out to be. When he scooped out of the ground that handful of dust to make the first man, he had perfection in mind. But then sin entered, and life got hard, and we got hurt, and people got banged up a lot. But Jesus doesn't scrap the damaged goods. He doesn't haul us off to the landfill. It would be easy for Jesus to toss aside the bruised reed and the smoking flax, but that is not in his nature. That is not how Jesus treats people. As far as Jesus is concerned, there are no disposable people. You need to know, Jesus is a huge recycler. He is. 
He redeems, restores, reconciles, revives. These are all Bible words. Jesus breathes new life into exhausted lives. He still has plans for bruised reeds and for smoking flax. And the Gospels are chock full of such examples. Think of the woman taken in adultery. This gal had been in more laps than a napkin. In fact, she was being exploited not only by the men or the man that she had slept with, but by the Pharisees who had arranged this tryst to trap Jesus. This gal was a pawn in a move to checkmate the Savior. Talk about a bruised reed. Yet Jesus, the only person in the crowd that day qualified to cast a stone, didn't. There was no malice in his voice when he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. How many times have we replayed those words in our own heads when we were guilty? Let's not forget them when the rocks are in our hands. Our Lord never broke a bruised reed. Think of Zacchaeus, the short guy with the tall list of sins. He was an enemy collaborator, a swindler to boot. He sold out his countrymen to strong arm for Rome. And Jesus spotted Zac up a tree. What a fitting place for him to be. In the proverbial sense, Zacchaeus lived his whole life out on a limb. But Jesus called him by name, invited himself to Zac's house for dinner. Zacchaeus had burned his bridges and given up hope. He was a smoking flax if there ever was one. But the favor he felt from Jesus relit a spark in his cold soul. The compassion of Jesus helped this little man stand tall again. Restitution now had a reason. Think of the Gadarean demoniac. When Jesus cast the demons out of him, the evil spirits immediately entered a herd of swine and drove them to suicide. (laughs) Imagine what those demons had been doing to the man. Or what about the sinful woman who came to Jesus at the Pharisee's house? She bathed the Lord's feet with her tears and with her perfume. Jesus said she had a big love. Because he had forgiven her a big debt. Or Peter's mother-in-law racked with a fever. Or the lame man who was lured down through the roof. Or Mary from Magdala who had boarded seven demons. Or the hemorrhaging woman who reached out and grabbed his garment. Or blind Bartimaeus who had been told to keep silent. Instead, he kept asking. Or any of the infectious lepers who cried to be cleansed. Or even Mary of Bethany who, like so many of us, was busy and tired from serving her Lord. These were all bruised people and smoldering hearts. And can you name me one that Jesus turned away? One crippled, choking soul he refused to help. You can't. And think of Peter. Oh, my. Perhaps the prime example of a bruised reed and a smoldering flax. This man's faith was so flimsy. Even after boasting of his loyalty, three times Peter denied his Lord in his most critical hour. Peter proved chicken before the rooster crowed. Afterwards, he was so discouraged he went fishing. He figured he wasn't cut out for this apostlehood. Besides, Jesus wouldn't use him now anyway, not after his failure. So Peter went back to what he knew. He figured he could fish. Yet by the lake, on the beach, the risen Lord Jesus renewed his calling to a discouraged Peter. Jesus told him, feed my sheep. Hey, these are just a few examples of God's grace in action. Realize our failure is no greater than Peter's failure. Yet Jesus didn't forsake Peter and he sure won't forsake you. Jesus doesn't bail on failed followers. I love Psalm 136. 26 times in 26 couplets, the psalmist repeats the phrase, His mercy endures forever. He's trying to ram it in our heads. Never give up on Jesus, for He's sure He's not going to give up on you. The Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, once commented on our text The feeblest are not disdained by Jesus. He is patient with those who are unlovely in his eyes. 
Jesus longs to bind up the broken reed and fan the smoking flax into flaming life. Oh, that poor sinners would remember this and trust in him. Okay, poor sinner, are you trusting in Jesus? Jesus is a splint to the bruised reed. Ever walk through a vegetable garden and see the stalks of tomato plants tied to their wooden stakes? On their own, those stalks aren't strong enough to keep the ripening tomatoes from dragging the ground. They need the strength and support of the stakes. And likewise, a bent person who's been nicked or scarred totters under their own weight. But Jesus is a splint to that person. He provides support at the very point of their brokenness. The strength of Jesus is what allows us to heal. Jesus holds us. Even when we would fall, he wraps his strong arms around our point of fragileness. Perhaps your injury is physical or emotional or relational or spiritual. It doesn't matter. Jesus promises to be your splint until you grow strong again. You've been betrayed by a friend. Now it's difficult for you to trust another person. You've loved someone and have been rejected, and now you're reluctant to love again. Your marriage is wounded. You're worried your relationship will never be as strong as it once was. Maybe you've embarked on a job or a ministry opportunity that didn't go so well, and now you doubt your gifts and callings. You're suffering a crisis of confidence. You're a bruised reed. But realize Jesus wants to give himself to you. What greater gift could he give? You know, the strategy you hear in the business world these days is to play to your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. But Jesus has a different way. He wants us to rely on him at the very point of our weakness. Let him show himself strong on your behalf. Jesus props up and builds up flimsy folk until they grow sturdy again. In the words of our text, he sends forth justice to victory. Jesus is a splint to the bruised reed. And make no mistake about it, he's also a flint to the smoking flax. Bears Grylls is the star of the TV show Man vs. Wild. It was one of my boy's favorite shows growing up, so I watched a lot of that show. Then Bears got a new survival show, Get Out Alive. It was one of my wife's favorite shows for a long time. So over the years, I've seen a lot of Bears Grylls. And one thing I've learned from him is that surviving in the wild, you need a flint. For with that small piece of flint, you can kindle a fire. And with fire, you can cook and boil water and stay warm and dry clothes. Listen, life is easier with fire. Every survivalist is excited to have fire. And the same is true spiritually. A life or a ministry or a marriage without spiritual fire, without the fires of enthusiasm and joy and motivation and love and commitment and passion and hope. Life can be very difficult without fire. To survive in the wild of this world, you need fire. Imagine two different rooms on a cold, frozen night. The first room has a roaring fire in the fireplace. The family's all gathered around the hearth. Everyone is enjoying the smell and light and warmth of the fire. But now the second room. On this chilly night, the fireplace is empty. Folks walk through this room, but it's not a living room. Far from it. No one lives in this room. There's no warmth or light to attract people to stay because there's no fire. And what I've described are not just two rooms, but two lives. One life contains the flame of God. The Holy Spirit lives inside this person. And people are attracted to the warmth and the love and the light that they sense. Whereas the other life is cold and empty and alone. There's no life in this room because there's no fire. There's nothing that would attract anyone to come here and stay. Our tendency is to walk away from the room that's cold and empty. Why would anyone want to hang out there? But Jesus refuses to leave such a life. 
He stays with that cold and empty person. He refuses to abandon them. He wants to build a fire. Jesus has flint. Jesus is the spark that can get the fires of enthusiasm burning again. At times it's hard to start a fire. You have to prime it and show some patience and be persistent. But those are all tasks that Jesus is good at. He's an expert at kindling fire. And not only can Jesus relight a fire in your heart, he can do the same in your marriage or in a friendship or for a confidence. Jesus can take smoldering kindling, just a flicker of a flame, and he can fan it back to a full-blown blaze. Jesus can reignite a ministry that had nearly died out. He can revive the dream or a vision that had almost faded. He can reestablish a respect that had been smothered by failure. Jesus specializes in rekindling burned out people. You remember what John the Baptist declared of Jesus? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Jesus is the Lord of the spark. He fires up new life. Yet understand the spiritual warfare that surrounds this ministry of Jesus. Our Lord is a splint and a flint, whereas our enemy is a harsh wind. In a wet blanket. Satan's nature is just the opposite of Jesus. Let me warn you. Satan has the killer instinct. Do you understand what I mean when I use that phrase, the killer instinct? Such a person doesn't just want to beat their opponent. They want to punish them. When he falls down, the goal is to finish him off. A football player with the killer instinct doesn't just tackle the quarterback. He tries to disable him and put him out of the game. And Satan has this kind of killer instinct. He doesn't just bend the reed or break its skin. He's the fierce wind that wants to blow it in two and tear it apart. Satan doesn't just let the fire die down. He's the wet blanket, the bucket of water that snuffs out the coals. And if it were not for Jesus, Satan would work his cruelty on us. There'd be no hope for recovery. Our first failure would be fatal. It's Jesus that keeps hope alive. Do you ever suffer from inexplicable moodiness? Oh, my wife does. No, No, her husband does. Now, do you ever ever suffer from inexplicable moodiness? You're soaring one day only to be depressed the next. It's amazing to me how vulnerable I can be to the highs and the lows, the ebbs and the flows. A lot causes this turbulence. But have you ever considered that a main cause could be spiritual? That wave of encouragement followed by that wave of despair may be the result of spiritual warfare? When a bout with the blues strikes at a strange time and for no apparent reason, there may actually be a spiritual battle raging to sink your faith. Discouragement isn't always traceable to discernible, obvious causes. The enemy of our soul loves to ambush our feelings. But likewise, encouragement can also rise up and roll in over us in that same sort of mysterious manner. Not long ago, my sons and I, we were burning some debris in the meadow behind our house. And we had a huge fire going. It was a big bonfire. It was late in the afternoon, and we had to hurry to douse it with with water and put out the big blaze. And it was a full two days later. Two days, mind you. I noticed smoke rising up from that meadow. I couldn't believe it, but that fire still had life. The wind had kicked up, it had stirred up a spark, and it had reignited the smoldering ashes. And this is what Jesus does in a believing heart. Even when there's no visible reason to be optimistic, even when a positive outlook isn't tied to anything tangible, even when you've seen it all burn out before your very eyes, hope can still swoop in. 
the Holy Spirit blows like a rushing mighty wind. He's dispatched from the throne of grace. The Spirit of Jesus comes to us like a splint and like a flint. You see, the starting point for you and I comes at the end of this morning's text. The last line we read, Isaiah said, In his name, Gentiles will trust. Do you trust Jesus? Do you? Do you trust him? Not not just in the macro sense, but do you trust him in a micro sense? You know, years ago, I was at the university. I was pursuing a degree in business, and I had to take two courses in economics, microeconomics and macroeconomics. Macro is the big picture. It involves market trends and government regulation and the health of the overall economy, whereas micro is more specific. It deals with the choices individual companies might make. And let me suggest that there is also such a thing as macro and micro faith. Macro faith looks at universal issues that apply to everyone, whereas micro faith examines matters that are specific to me and you. Macro faith embraces the overarching truths. There is a God. His son is Jesus. He died to save me. He's alive today. The Bible is his word. But there's also such a thing as micro faith. And this is the faith that you and I are called on to have in the nitty gritty of life. Do I let Jesus influence my thoughts? Do I obey him in my finances? Do I lean on him with my emotional needs? Do I trust him in the day-to-day of my life? See, both the macro and micro are important. You could say it like this. My eternal salvation depends on macro faith, while my internal salvation depends on micro faith. A bruised reed and a smoking flax needs a specific, targeted faith. We need to trust Jesus in the day-to-day. I'm sure you have the macro faith, but what about the micro? Do you trust Jesus at the exact point of your break? Right where the mending and healing needs to occur, do you trust him there? At the very moment when the fire is about to smolder and die out, that's when your faith needs to kick in. 2,000 years ago, a man was rejected and beaten and crucified and buried. Yet three days later, he rose from the dead, never to die again. You believe that. But the empty tomb is proof of so much more. Right now, your back is against the wall. You face what seems to be insurmountable problems. You're looking for reasons to hope, but not finding many. That's why you need to look again to that empty tomb. Jesus, too, was once a damaged reed. He became cold embers for us. Are you telling me that your problems are greater than the hardships that Jesus faced? Certainly not. Yet in the end, the Lord triumphed over our arch enemies, both sin and death. Now with that victory under his belt, nothing is impossible for Jesus. And Jesus will work miracles in your life if you trust him. Understand, your discouragement isn't a big deal. In the grand scheme, it's tiny. It's the size of a mere coin. In contrast, Jesus is larger than the sun itself. His light is brighter. The warmth he generates is more powerful. But here's what can happen. If I hold that coin up very close to my eyeball, it can block out the very sun. To me, at that moment, that coin becomes larger than the sun itself. If I allow it, a tiny coin can block out the enormous sun. And in the same way, a small but well-placed speck of discouragement can devastate our faith. If we're going to walk in victory, we can't allow anything to ever get between our eyes and God's Son. 
What's a dad and his little boy were planning a fishing trip? For weeks, it's all this son could talk about. They were planning to leave the very next day. Excitement had been building and building in this little boy. Well, the night before the big trip, the father was tucking his son into bed when the little guy looked up at his dad and he told him, Daddy, thank you for tomorrow. And this is what faith says. Lord, thank you for tomorrow. Jesus rose from the dead to be there in your tomorrow. Even when your strength fails or your passion fades, Jesus promises to be there in your tomorrow. A bruised reed, he will not break. A smoking flax, he will not quench. This is how Jesus treats us. All that's left is for us to trust in him.